Those of us in the long COVID community might have got used to the idea of what the disease is, what it does, and just how awful it is to live with it. But many people out there are still unfamiliar with it, despite vague attempts by the media to cover this subject. So I thought it'd be useful to take down the 15 biggest misconceptions one by one. Stick around and let's blow them to bits together. Misconception number one actually came from my best friend, who I've known for over 30 years and has been in close contact with me uh, during the last two years I've been suffering from long COVID. It came up when he caught COVID recently and I was advising him what to do. Anyway, I had to put him right when he said, but long COVID's super rare anyway, right? Um, no, it's not. Between one in three and one in six cases of COVID-19 will go on to develop long COVID. That's for Delta, and we've got no idea what it will be for Omicron. Long COVID is absolutely not rare. The ONS update their figures regularly, and with 1.2 million people in the UK alone, being blasé about getting infected is not a risk worth taking. Misconception number two. It's just being a bit tired. OMG, no. I have run marathons, done multiple consecutive all-nighters whilst running my own business, flown from Thailand to London to LA and back again, and nothing, absolutely nothing, compares to the sheer fundamental exhaustion that comes with long COVID. It's very, very unlikely that if you've led a healthy life, you'll have experienced anything like it. Misconception number three. Long COVID is only experienced by people who had a severe infection or were hospitalized. Whilst those who leave hospital or ICU often take a long time to recover, this post-ITU syndrome is not what's come to be commonly known as long COVID. The vast, vast majority of long haulers only had a mild infection to begin with. I was one of those feeling foolishly smug about the power of my immune system whilst my colleagues who got ill at the same time were feverish and bedridden and I was cracking on and working from home. It didn't take long, unfortunately, for those tables to turn. Just look at those ONS numbers again if you're not sure about this. It's not like the UK has 1.2 million ICU beds for these people with long COVID to have recently vacated. Misconception number four you must have had an underlying condition. Whilst there are some risk factors for developing long COVID, see this film I made recently, you couldn't class them as underlying conditions. We're talking about things like being female, uh, being young to middle-aged, or previously having had some allergies. The reality is that most long haulers were previously fit, healthy, and extremely active. In fact, there is more of a correlation with those who are highly fit than those who are unfit, obese, or diabetic, for example. The condition really does strike down healthy people in their prime, and this is an entirely different demographic than those who are at risk of death from a COVID infection, who obviously tend to be older, and some of those underlying conditions may increase their risk. Misconception number five. You can't get it if you're young, fit, and healthy. Well, see misconception number four. You're more likely to get it if you're young, fit, and healthy. And it might not make much sense until you consider the parallel example of vaccine reactions. Did your parents or grandparents feel unwell after taking the vaccine? Probably not. Did you? Probably yes, especially on the second one. Why? Because your immune system is raring to go and it's the activation of your immune system that makes you feel unwell after the vaccine. Older people, on the other hand, don't have quite such tuned up immune systems, so when they get the vaccine, they tend not to feel much more than a jab in the arm. And with immune or autoimmune reactions heavily implicated in long COVID, we can start to see why young, fit and healthy individuals are more at risk. Misconception number six, kids can't get it. Well, I'm afraid to say they absolutely can. They might not get it in the same numbers as the adult population, but they can be very, very severely affected. I made a film about that too, if you'd like to know more. Misconception number seven, the long COVID clinics will sort you out. Ah, uh, how I wish this were true. The simple and sad truth is that without the textbook chapter on long COVID being written yet, there's only so much the clinics can do. They can do a number of investigations and perhaps give you some symptomatic relief, but they don't know what's causing long COVID yet. So until they do, it's like a fire extinguisher trying to put out the towering inferno. Misconception number eight, 
you're just deconditioned. You need to get out more. Oh God. The problem is some of the less well-informed doctors will tell you this with the best of intentions. The problem is they're applying post-ITU recovery principles to an entirely different condition. Long COVID will absolutely F you up if you try and exercise your way out of it. The reality is that long COVID is much closer to ME than it is to post-ITU syndrome. And I don't need to tell you what would happen if you walked into a room full of ME and CFS sufferers and told them they just need to exercise more. In fact, this recent study put some of the final nails into the coffin of the deconditioning school of thought. The link is available in the description. Misconception number nine. It's all in your head. You just need to think positive. Closely related to misconception number eight, this one exists in a world where CBT is prescribed to treat chronic conditions. The fact is we quite clearly know it's not all in your head with recent discoveries of microclotting in the blood of long haulers and distinctly aberrant autoimmune responses. The problem is this research is brand new and hasn't filtered into the minds of mainstream medicine just yet. Misconception number 10. You look well, so there's nothing wrong with you. While some of the time you might look fairly wrecked with a pallid complexion and bags under the eyes, at other times you might look fine. No one can see what's wrong with you, so they assume nothing is wrong with you. As an example of the invisibility of the condition, last year I broke my pelvis getting knocked off my motorbike at 70 miles an hour. I immediately had swarms of well-wishers and people asking to help, which was wonderful. But as terrible as breaking my pelvis was, the truth was I would repeatedly break it and put myself back in hospital every six weeks in preference to having long COVID. Obviously having both at the same time really did suck. Misconception number 11. You've had a good day, therefore you're recovered. Again, this one is connected to the invisibility of the illness. Unfortunately, recovery isn't linear. You might feel like a human again one day, only to be absolutely splattered and have the full constellation of symptoms the next. In fact, this up-down pattern is well recognized by just about everyone who's suffering with the condition. Misconception number 12. It's just normal getting over a virus because I was tired after a cold too. Hmm. Well, it doesn't normally take you two years to get over a cold, does it? I mean, I'm still unable to go back to work in my old job because a couple of consecutive 12 to 14 hour days would wipe me out for a week. I can't exercise at all. I can't eat pizza, curry, tomatoes, strawberries, anything spicy, anything tasty basically, or drink tea, coffee, or alcohol. I can't socialize because I simply don't have the juice. Long COVID takes every aspect of your life and pretty much crushes it. It's a very, very long way from recovering after a normal virus. A recent study, in fact, found that long haulers had a poorer quality of life than advanced cancer patients. That tells you something about how severe and debilitating the condition is. Misconception number 13. Your tests are all normal, so there's nothing wrong with you. Ugh. This is another shocker and stems from an arrogance about the omnipotence of modern medicine. I'm pretty sure all of a Victorian doctor's tests would come back normal for Ebola or AIDS too. That doesn't mean the patient doesn't have those conditions. It's just that the doctors didn't know what to look for or didn't have the right diagnostic tests to detect it. We are, however, starting to get there now in long COVID. But if you ask your local GP to look for microclots under a fluorescent microscope, you're pretty likely to be met with a blank stare. Misconception number 14. You don't have antibodies, therefore it can't be long COVID. Ah, but did you know that long haulers are in fact more likely not to develop antibodies? Here's some hard numbers for you. 36% of long haulers don't seroconvert, and women are four times more likely to serorevert. Basically, it's extremely common for long haulers not to develop antibodies after an infection. Why? We don't quite have the answer yet, but it's likely to be related to the characteristic immune response itself. And finally, misconception number 15. There's no research on long COVID yet. Well, actually, if you choose to look, there's loads. Here's my running list of what I collect when I find interesting studies. When you start to piece together all of this research, there's actually more of a jigsaw puzzle in place than many clinicians realize. One of the most important recent discoveries is the relationship between endothelial dysfunction, hyperactivated platelets, and microclotting. 
and autoimmune pathways are likely implicated too. Research to bring all of this together is of critical importance, but we know enough now to start appropriate investigations and treatments, if only the medical establishment was prepared to treat the condition a little more seriously. So if you're a long hauler, you may have found many of these misconceptions painfully familiar. And if you're not, I hope you have a little more understanding of the condition the next time you meet someone who's suffering with it. Look after yourselves, until next time.